B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, news and comment. It's Tuesday, June 11th, 2019. This week, 10 years ago, I launched this podcast. And according to Google Analytics, we have listeners in 71 countries. Wow. And so here's what I'd like to propose. To honor the 10th anniversary here, I would like listeners to check in. I would like you to drop an email to peter at peterbcollins.com and give me 25 words or less. Where you are, how often you listen, what you agree with or disagree with, what you consider valuable about spending time listening to Peter B. Collins' rant and rave. And if you decide to take out a subscription, too, I would be honored. But first and foremost, I want to do a little uh, <laughs> amateur census here and see who is listening. Some of you may have been with me all 10 years. Some of you maybe even listened to my syndicated radio show, which we operated from KRXA in Monterey and syndicated to stations all up and down the West Coast and even for a time to the East Coast. And there may even be one or two stragglers who go back to my days in San Francisco radio. And I have found one or two who go all the way back to my early days in Chicago at WDAI, or WLSFM, from 1973 to 1976. So I'd be curious uh, where you got on the PBC train and where you are today. So, that is my request here as we observe 10 years of podcasting at PeterBCollins.com. Our lead story today, I once again want to sing the praises of Whitney Webb. She is a remarkable investigative reporter, uh, one of the lead reporters at Mint Press News, and she does it all from Chile, where she has lived for some period of time. And when I first saw this story today, my skeptical software kicked in because she asserts that tech giants in the United States have been laying off American workers and hiring workers offshore in Israel. And that's what led to my headline today, Will Trump Hit Israel with Tariffs? Because when you see the dimensions of this move to offshore American technology, and put it in the hands of uh, companies either run from the United States or with Israeli startups, many which are tied to either the Mossad or Unit 8200, which is the Israeli equivalent of the NSA. So Google, Microsoft, Intel, Facebook. Many of these top tech companies are shifting investment and jobs to Israel at record rates. They collect sizable U.S. government subsidies for their operations while they move critical aspects of their business abroad and continue to lay off thousands of American workers. Now, I have not heard about these layoffs here in the United States because we're so busy getting excited about the low unemployment rate. And as you know, that's a figure that doesn't really accurately reflect those who are out of the job market. But it should reflect the tech layoffs that have been happening. For example, Microsoft over the last four years has laid off 20,000 workers while they've been hiring in Israel. And Whitney Webb reports that a man at the center of all this is the guy who Greg Palast lovingly refers to as America's leading vulture capitalist. His name is Paul Singer. He writes checks to pro-Israel groups. He also is one of the major bondholders of the debt of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And we are told that he is uh, investing and supporting these efforts to build tech centers in Israel, in part as a retaliation or at least reaction for the impact of the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions aimed at Israel. 
So Business Insider in 2016 reported that Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple had all opened up research and development centers in Israel. And more recently, SanDisk, NVIDIA, PayPal, Palantir, and Dell. Earlier this year, Intel announced it would be investing $11 billion in a new factory in Israel. And it has cut 12,000 jobs in the United States in the last couple of years. So we hear a lot about Trump's ire over China, the jobs that have been lost. He wanted to renegotiate NAFTA, and he's still pummeling Mexico over trade issues. We'll get to that in a moment. But Israel, of course, we call our ally. We pretend that this is a democracy, and that uh, we will defend it in every way. And Paul Singer has invested $20 million to fund and create an organization called Startup Nation Central, inspired by a book that was written by a guy named Dan Sinor, who happens to be on Paul Singer's payroll. <laughs> And so uh, you see the kind of incestuous nature of this. Dan Sinor, who was a Bush administration mouthpiece, that's uh, George W. Bush, uh, he is a co-founder of the Foreign Policy Initiative funded by Paul Singer. And Dan Sinor's sister, Wendy Singer, unrelated to Paul, a longtime director of APAC, has become the organization's executive director. But I don't expect any day soon to hear Trump threatening tariffs against Israel for stealing our jobs. And these are high-paying jobs. The tech sector <laughs> pays very well. So I find it fascinating, and I commend Mint Press News and Whitney Webb for another big original story. Also related to Israel, the New York Times today, profiling young Americans who are Jewish, who were invited on a two-week trip to Israel by an organization called Birthright Israel. More than 700,000 young Jewish Americans have made the trip. 33,000 are set to travel this summer. And the Times reports that there is a growing group of people who take the Birthright trip, but who are not swallowing the Israeli line Entirely. Many of them have peeled off from the organized tours to conduct their own meetings with Palestinians. And some of this is orchestrated by groups that counter. Uh, these are liberal groups in Israel who are trying to promote, uh, I'd say, a more open-minded approach. But it's interesting because the Times cites some research that shows that uh, when you look at American Jews over the age of 50... Only 6% think that the U.S. gives Israel too much support. But when you look at people aged 18 to 29 who are Jewish Americans, 25% of them believe that America gives too much support to Israel. So that's just a little barometer of those attitudes. But if 25% of this summer's birthright uh, students have opinions like that and act on them, I think that could send a very interesting message. So yesterday we were reporting that the New York Times stated that the so-called deal that Trump squeezed out of Mexico with the threat of tariffs and his bullying gringo tactics was really just rehashed uh, agreements that had been made in the past. And that is somewhat correct. But based on new information coming from the Mexican side of the negotiations... The Washington Post is reporting that Mexico did beef up its commitments. It had talked about deploying uh, its National Guard at the Guatemalan border, but according to the Post, uh, they have beefed that up. They've said that they'll send 6,000 and that they are actually going to, uh, for the first time, try to control that border. I don't think they'll use the term seal the border, but I think they will try to control it. Uh, Mexico described its plan to U.S. officials as, quote, the first time in recent history that Mexico has decided to take operational control of its southern border as a priority. 
And Trump is saying that uh, there is this secret deal that Mexico has fully signed and documented, and it hasn't been publicly disclosed because he wants Mexico to be allowed to announce it. Tweeting earlier today, he said it will be revealed in the not-too-distant future. The measures are an important part of the deal with Mexico and one that the U.S. has been asking about getting for many years. Now, unlike his secret plan for the uh, war in Syria, which is still secret, (laughs) maybe this will be revealed in uh, the near future. But, of course, he continues to threaten that tariffs will be reinstated if he's unhappy with Mexico's uh, results. And this is the really frustrating part of this. It is so arbitrary, emotional, and fuzzy. Trump never sets specific terms and says, well, if you do this, I will do that. And if you don't do this, I will do something else. He leaves it vague. And he believes that this gives him greater leverage. But I believe that while optically this is going to be seen as a win by many of Trump's supporters who (laughs) have a deep racist bias against immigrants, at the same time we are paying a price that I don't think is being properly calculated. Because by forcing Mexico into this humiliating arrangement and they're trying to put off This asylum game where Mexico would, uh, you know, grant asylum to people from uh, Guatemala and people from El Salvador can get their asylum in Guatemala. It really doesn't make sense because people who are fleeing poverty and violence in the northern triangle of Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Are they going to be notably safer in a neighboring country? I I don't see that the resources are there to stabilize them. And the idea that criminal gangs that operate in those countries can't cross a border, (laughs) it doesn't make sense to me. So I, I think there are a lot of loco elements to this, but fundamentally, the breach in international relations, the way Trump uses these bully tactics, threats, and intimidation on a neighboring country that is an ally, well, I believe that this will have long-term implications, and they won't be good for the United States. Kevin Gostola revealing more of the cruel treatment that we visit on immigrants to this country based on a recent hearing. He reports that uh, a man who was in custody of ICE with metatastic, yeah, that's right, metas, uh, I'm sorry, metastatic cancer was brought to a hospital in Houston and a doctor was not able to conduct a proper examination because the agents wouldn't let him remove the restraints that ran across his body. And the, ma- the man died a few weeks later. In another case, a doctor asked ICE agents to remove shackles from a patient who was critically ill. The agents would provide no information on why the restraints were necessary. And the doctor said, I couldn't think of the rationale of chaining someone who is so sick that he almost died. And this comes from a report by Physicians for Human Rights on uh, the way that we are treating people in a subhuman and immoral way. One other is that medical professionals allege that information shared by unaccompanied uh, children in therapy sessions was then accessed by immigration authorities and used against them in deportation hearings. So these are just fundamental violations of human rights that I believe represent the stark racism involved here. We're not going to sanction Israel for the loss of jobs. We're going to punish poverty-stricken, desperate brown people who are trying to get themselves and or their families to a safer place. And by ignoring that, I believe that it's not just a (laughs) karma backlash. I think that we will pay a price. 
Another story from Customs and Border Protection, a subcontractor to that agency was hacked. And that data breach exposed the photos of tens of thousands of travelers coming in and out of the United States. This is a database of traveler photos and license plate images. And the border people aren't telling us what port of entry uh, was the source of these photos that have now been compromised. And they offer this number fewer than 100,000. <laughs> 98,000? Uh, but this just shows a, a number of problems. First of all, we are shifting to facial recognition software, and we have not adequately studied the implications of it. We don't have rules, standards, and when there is a false positive, and there is no appeal process or other avenue for a victim to find justice. And the other thing I'll mention, because uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to take three weeks off and do some international travel. And the last few times I've returned to the United States from being abroad, wherever I check in, they offer you the option to speed your process through the border checkpoint by allowing them to take a fresh picture of you for their database. And that picture shows up at the kiosk where you then go to uh, be processed by a border agent. And all you're doing is feeding the files of the federal government and giving them more photos and visual evidence that can be somehow used against you in the future. We are told that it's optional to have this fresh picture taken when you arrive at an American immigrant checkpoint. But I think most people think it's required. Also, an interesting report at BuzzFeed today that Facebook quietly and abruptly turned off a set of advanced search features last week. And they used the case of a Libyan commander who is accused of war crimes named Mahmoud al-Warfali. And al-Warfali is accused of ordering the execution of 33 people in Benghazi. At the core of the evidence against him are seven videos, some of which have been found on Facebook, allegedly showing, showing him committing crimes. And a woman at the... Uh, let's see, I have to get her first name here. Sorry. <laughs> Alexa Koenig, that's her name. Executive Director of the Human Rights Center at the University of California, Berkeley. She said Facebook's recent decision to turn off the features in its graph search product could be a disaster for human rights research. She said, we need Facebook to be working with us and making access to such information easier, not more difficult. In simple terms, Facebook graph search is a way to receive an answer to a specific query, like people in Nebraska who like Metallica. <laughs> and... You can uh, imagine if you look up uh, al Warfali and Libya that the videos that I mentioned a moment ago would be available as long as they are public. So Facebook turned off several features that have long been accessible via graph search, like the ability to find public videos that a specific Facebook user was tagged in. And the human rights advocates say the decision shows how Facebook's response to data scandals and its resulting push to emphasize privacy is making it more difficult to investigate what happens on the platform. John Stewart was on Capitol Hill this morning before the House Judiciary Committee, only most of the committee members weren't there. The room was packed with 9-11 first responders and victims of the fallout from the destruction of the World Trade Centers. And as you know, I don't embrace the official story of 9-11. But that doesn't lead me to deny in any way the interest and the rights of those who reported for duty at the World Trade Center and exposed themselves to a toxic soup in the air, on the ground. And they deserve the full support of our government. But they're not getting it. In fact, the payments to the 9-11 first responders have been cut because the fund is running out of money. 
And John Stewart, the former Daily Show host who has made this a lifeline, a kind of lifetime commitment, he got pretty angry. He said, as I sit here today, I can't help but think what an incredible metaphor this room is for the entire process that is getting health care and benefits for for, for 9-11 first responders and what it has come to. Behind me, a filled room of 9-11 first responders, and in front of me, a nearly empty Congress. It's an embarrassment to the country, a stain on this institution. You should be ashamed of yourselves. For those that aren't here, but you won't be, because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber. Your indifference costs these men and women their most valuable commodity, time. It's the one thing they're running out of. This hearing should be flipped. These men and women should be up on that stage, and Congress should be down here answering their questions as to why this is so hard and takes so damn long. 20,000 people are covered by the funds, but uh, the money is running out, and so far Congress has refused to replenish that fund. Missouri's last abortion clinic is still open. Planned Parenthood in St. Louis is operating on a temporary basis after Judge Michael Steltzer clarified that he hasn't made a final decision, but the clinic will be allowed to keep its license uh, as he works through the process. And the same judge, Steltzer, has ruled in favor of Planned Parenthood. Last week, he sided with the clinic in one of the central issues of the dispute and agreed that medical staff were not employed by Planned Parenthood and cannot be forced to submit to questioning from the state licensing agency. And on May 31st, he granted the clinic its first temporary injunction, allowing it to remain open beyond the stated expiration of its state license. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. People like the incredible Carl Howard, who also checks my hot links in the show file for every day's podcast and lets me know when I get them wrong. Brian Mazzi, Terry Paris, Theodore Kelly, they're all regular contributors to this podcast. And I mention that not to shame you, but to set an example. And if you want to be generous here as we observe our 10th anniversary and make a one-time contribution, you can do that via PayPal. The details are on the sign-up page at peterbcollins.com. Also, as you know, if you take out a new annual subscription, I've got bonus books. I've got copies of 2100, A Dystopian Utopia. It's a powerful book, and I'd love to share one with you. Or there is Trump on the Couch by Washington, D.C. psychiatrist Dr. Justin A. Frank. All of it can be yours with a new annual subscription. Well, not all of it, one of it. (laughs) I get kind of carried away sometimes. But I would love to send you a bonus book for your new annual subscription and a mailing address here in the U.S. of A. So it turns out that Trump and Joe Biden are both campaigning in Iowa for the 2020 presidential campaign. Now, they're in different regions of the Hawkeye State, So there's no risk that they are going to cross paths. But Joe Biden released his uh, statement early this morning in time to create fodder for Trump's daily tweet. I was going to say (laughs) shitstorm, tweet storm. And so Biden has questioned Trump's intelligence, challenged his morals. Quote, the president is literally an existential threat to America. And of course, Trump who loves to punch back uh, four times as hard in his little pea brain. He brought up uh, Biden's dismal finish in the 2008 presidential campaign, saying that Obama took him off the trash heap, says that uh, Biden is now a different guy. He acts different. He's slower. Joe Biden is a dummy, he said. Now, this puts me in a tough spot. (laughs) I I don't think Joe Biden is a dummy. But I don't think that Joe Biden is presidential material. He carries so much baggage and Trump delights in ripping into it. And while Biden makes intelligent remarks like Trump doesn't get the basics of his trade war, he thinks his tariffs are being paid by China, any beginning econ student at Iowa or Iowa State could tell you that the American people are paying his tariffs. The cashiers at Target see what's going on. Now, that's, <laughs> that is a reasonable comment for Joe Biden to make. But 
he has spent so much time defending himself from past issues, whether it is the Hyde Amendment on abortion rights, where he stood on race relations, he was opposed to busing when he first came to the Senate. So his history and his connection to Obama just produced so many targets for Trump to continue forcing him to defend the past, which would prevent Biden from running a forward-looking campaign. So I don't see much promise to Joe Biden running for president, even though there are many moderate Democrats who think that he is the key to beating Trump. I think they're wrong. Lee Fung is a great investigative reporter now at The Intercept, and he did a good background check on Kamala Harris, the junior senator from California who's running for president. And I'm not very excited about Kamala Harris running for president. I think she's doing an okay job as senator from California. But I don't think she has the seasoning. And she's gotten tripped up on her message. Because she's trying to run as a prosecutor. That's her background. She was the district attorney in San Francisco and the attorney general of the state of California. But what Lee Fung points out is that on her campaign kickoff, she declared she's always fought on behalf of survivors of sexual assault. But there's one big exception. When she was the district attorney in San Francisco, she inherited a file of cases related to predatory priests who had sexually abused mostly young men. And her predecessor, whom she defeated, a man I know, Terrence Hallinan, had a series of cases that he was bringing against the archdiocese of San Francisco. And when Kamala Harris got there, Instead of releasing the clergy abuse files that Hallinan wanted to make public, she refused. And in her seven years as DA, she did not proactively assist in civil cases against clergy sex abuse. She ignored requests by activists and survivors to access those files. And now she wants to claim that, well, she wants to sanitize that record and make you believe that she has always been there to defend those who are victims of sexual abuse. Washington Post has done a deep dive on the finances of the National Rifle Association, and there's a lot of uh, cronyism and insider dealing that's going on. A former pro football player who's on the NRA board was paid $400,000 for public outreach and firearms training. We know that the head of the NRA, Wayne LaPierre, has racked up hundreds of thousands of dollars in charges at a Beverly Hills clothing boutique on foreign travel. Oliver North, who was forced out after trying to throw out LaPierre, was set to collect millions of dollars in a deal with the NRA's now estranged public relations agency called Ackerman McQueen. And so Wayne LaPierre who is grifting out of the NRA to buy fancy suits and pay for his uh, exotic travel, pointed the finger at Ollie North, who was grifting from the NRA, and uh, they didn't have a duel, but it's clear that Ollie North lost. And the Post cites a Washington attorney and expert on nonprofits, Douglas Farley, The volume of transactions with insiders and affiliates of insiders is really astonishing. 18 out of 75 members of the unpaid board of the NRA had some sort of income from the organization. I often criticize the New York Times, and today I want to praise Charlie Savage and Carol Rosenberg, the authors of the reporters who wrote a second-day story about the Supreme Court's refusal to take up a Guantanamo case from a man who has been trapped there for 17 years, never been charged with a crime, and may spend the rest of his life there. The article uh, expands on the comments of Justice Stephen Breyer, the only justice who wanted to hear the case. Not Sotomayor. Not Kagan. (laughs) Certainly not Brett Kavanaugh. 
And the big question is, if the Afghanistan war grinds on for years, is that still the basis to hold so-called enemy combatants at Guantanamo? And the Yemeni man who did not have his case heard has argued that the legal base for holding him as a wartime detainee has unraveled to the point of irrelevance. Under the laws of war, to prevent captured enemies from returning to the battlefield, a military can detain them without trial until hostilities end. And we've been told that uh, we won that war in Afghanistan. <laughs> Obama did declare victory. I don't know if you recall. And so this is a thorny issue that deserves full public discussion. And my local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, buried it in a two-inch little by-the-way story in the paper today. A couple of quickies before I go. In Moscow, the journalist Ivan Golanov has been released after a massive protest where the three major newspapers put out nearly identical front pages to support his release. And I don't know all the details of this case, but it is interesting that public pressure could produce that kind of result in Russia. And I keep screaming for the release of Chelsea Manning, who has no business being held for contempt. I heard a report today that the Justice Department has finalized its extradition request for Julian Assange. So they can't add any more charges against him. And that makes the incarceration of Chelsea Manning unnecessary, unjustified, and irrational. And finally today, I want to recommend a piece over at ConsortiumNews.com by our pal Pepe Escobar. He covered the meeting in St. Petersburg and Moscow last week between Putin and Xi Jinping of China. They met in Moscow and they made a commitment to develop bilateral trade and cross-border payments using the ruble and the yuan, bypassing the U.S. dollar. And then Xi went to St. Petersburg, where he visited the International Economic Forum. Additional agreements that were signed uh, embrace a comprehensive partnership, strategic interaction, and global strategic stability. And Escobar has been covering this for some time warning that Russia and China have been basically forced into a partnership by the United States, and it's been aggravated by Trump's antics. Xi stressed that China won't seek development at the expense of the environment. China will implement the Paris Climate Agreement. And so this kind of uh, approach, which is a really dramatic shift, is outlined by Pepe Escobar in a way that uh, I recommend you absorb. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it with absolutely anyone, including Vladimir Putin. You'll find it on YouTube. And I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until Again, happy trails.